we're looking at James. Uh, on your paper, you should be looking at James. I noticed this morning as I was going over my notes, it's not 16, it's 26. 26 and 27 up at the top of your page on the right-hand side. So I'm, I'm reading from verse 26 and 27. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, I want you to pay attention now that word religious. It's used three times in, this, in these two verses. Used three times. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless or vain. This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained or unblemished by the world. Today, notice the word world, uh, religion is used. Um, if anyone thinks he, he is to be reli religious, notice that's an introductory idea. And that's a first class condition if, if this is true, then, and then he goes on with the discussion on it. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, I'm going to deal with bridle the tongue next week. But, uh, <clears throat> but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is vain. We're going to talk about vain and pure religion. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God to visit the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained in the world. So the re word religion dominates our subject matter there as far as um, repetition. We look for markers like that in our studies. Notice at the top of your paper, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Notice at the top of your paper, I gave you the Greek word for pure. And the word pure means that you have something that might have had defects in it, has been gone through a fire and been purified, or has been cleansed. And so we got something that's pure, you know. You understand that process? That's the word pure. Notice cleansed or free from corruption. Uh, I think that's self-explanatory. And so there is a pure religion, and then there's a vain religion, and these are contrasted. Notice the word vain. It, and, and it had, you're going to see today there's two general concepts of that, vain or worthless. Uh, the New American Standard called it worthless or vain, empty. Uh, this... There, there are two concepts that we're going to study about in our introduction. We're going to study about vain religion that's covered in idolatry. That would be vain. Uh, they're worshiping a, a, a something that is not God and could never be God. It's made in the image and likeness of man's image. And then the other part that is going to be about vain religion is legalism. And you'll see both of these this morning in my introduction. Then we're going to talk about pure religion a pure religion, something that has been cleansed from this and is pure, been cleansed from idolatrous practices, been cleansed from legalistic practices, practices which corrupt, it corrupts what's pure, corrupts it. So we're going to talk about that. I want to show you something I want you to pray with me about. Planting the flag. Planting the flag. The for us, the flag that we, we want to plant, we want to plant it in Moody, is categorical Bible doctrine. What's missing in much of the church today, it's not that there's not teaching going on. It's not that the Bible is not being taught and, and taught properly. What's the missing link in it is categorical teaching. Categorical teaching. That's the way the human mind thinks. And that's the way people approach problems. They have a problem in their life. They go to somebody and say, I've got a problem. They, they want to know what is the problem. <laughs> that's, a big, that's a big menu, isn't it? I've got a problem. So you have to say, what is the problem? And then he may tell you one thing, and then you've got to narrow it down. He say, well, I'm having marital problems. You go like, 
let's talk a little more and see if we can get it boiled down to something even more. They said, well, we have poor communications or my husband thinks he's going to leave me and all that. So you keep narrowing. When somebody comes to you and says, so what you're trying to do is narrow it down to something specifically that you can actually put your hands on and deal with it. We call that categorical. The idea is, what does the Bible say? I mean, once, you, once you've got your issue, then what's the Bible say? How do you resolve it and know that you've got God's assistance? You know, a lot of ways to solve problems. What you want to do is have God solve them for you, and then you've got something eternal. And so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to start a mission program in Moody. In fact, we've already started some. But we're going to start a mission program to plant the flag of categorical Bible doctrine in Moody. Uh, whew. That was pure luck right there. <laughs> I probably couldn't do that again a million years. Uh, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for that. We want to start a mission. And so we've got some we've got some stuff going out there, and 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 we're we we're getting our feet in the water, and we're definitely going to try to plant a flag of categorical teaching out in the Moody area uh, this year, and sooner than we might think. So I want you to pray about that. Uh, this is a wonderful thing. We've planted a, a doctrinal flag here, and believe it or not, we've planted a lot of them. Uh, some of them some of them last, and some didn't. But, um, but we're, we're definitely going to do that. Uh, so pray for the mission that we're, we've got a mission team already out, on the, uh, already out in that area, and we're going to develop more on it. And you know some about it. Now, whether or not anybody else wants to be involved in that mission, I don't know. But, but, um, but we, are gonna, we, are, we are going full steam on this uh, with the mission concept. Well, let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to get in our morning study on pure and vain religion. I give you a mode of silence. You remember the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. What do I do about it? You've got to confess them. You've got to do it silent to yourself. You're a priest. 1 Peter 2 says you're a priest. You confess your sins to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue of earth sins, you know, the, you know the procedure, but it needs to be done. Why? Holy Spirit who dwells in you is the great teacher of the word of God. They drove into our assembly time and others who have dropped in through the internet all, from all over the world, and we're thankful for them as well today. And we pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of God there are many out there that are in vain religion and others in pure religion. They need to know the difference and how to get out of one and into the other. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, notice at the top of your paper, we introduced it. We showed you the Greek words. There are two different Greek words. You can see that they're very obviously two different Greek words. And the word vain, matias, the matias is the word that deals with idolatrous practices that came out of the Gentiles. When you're reading the New Testament, uh, Paul, Paul go, he goes to the Gentiles. The, goes to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were under uh, paganism. They were under idolatrous religion. They, they were, Paul went to most religious people. Some of them were out of the Greek and Roman uh, culture that comes all the way back to the Tower of Babel uh, business in uh, Old Testament. Uh, all they do is just keep changing uh, culturally what people believe and still run the same idolatry. And so by the time we get to the Greeks and the Romans, when Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles, he was going to the Greek Roman Empire, right? Well, yeah. And so, and it was idolatrous. And so he battles that on the one hand, and on the other hand, he's battling uh, Jewish legalism, people who want to stay with the law and don't want to give it up for grace. And so he has almost every Paul, everywhere Paul went in the Gentile world, he, he had to fight two battlefields at the same time. 
He had to fight the battlefield of pagan, idolatrous religion. At the same time, he had to fight Jewish legalism. I'll show it to you today. But that was Paul's warfare. And he talks about vain religion. And then he talks about pure religion. So I'm going to talk it in general terms. Now, he's going to talk about vain religion. We'll talk about it next Sunday when he says vain religion can creep into pure religion. And I'll talk about that next week. Uh, but I'm talking it in general terms today. Uh, notice at the very top, of, uh, uh, probably the second paragraph on your paper, vain, re vain idolatrous religion is mentioned on Paul's first missionary trip. When you study Acts 13, 14, you're on Paul's first missionary trip. He takes three in the book of Acts. Actually, he takes four, but he takes three in the book of Acts. And this is the first. In fact, the bulk of the, half the book of Acts is about his three missionary trips. From 13 on, we're into Gentile ministry. Uh, the first 12 chapters is Jewish ministry, and the, the second half of the book is about Gentile ministry. So we're in Paul, when we're in chapter 13, 14, we're in Paul's first missionary trip. Okay? Paul's first missionary trip. Now, I want you to pay attention. We're in Acts 14, 8 through 18. Now, Paul goes into Lystra. Paul goes into Lystra. And he heals a layman from birth, a person that apparently uh, part of that breach birth kind of business that often in the older days, a lot of people come out crippled from it and such as that. This is a person that was lame from birth, and, and Paul healed him. It's interesting when you, now I want you to later read that whole, that whole experience, 8 through 18. I'm just going to give you the synoptics of it, okay? But it's really interesting why Paul healed him. When Paul was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he had a, this man sat there, and he was fixated on the message. Now, we've all had that opportunity where we've taught people and they just are glued to what you're saying. And as a speaker, you go like, oh, I got one that's interesting. And that really fires you up, doesn't it? When you find somebody that's really interested in things you have to say. Well, he watched him. And the guy was, so when Paul, when Paul got at some place to stop and give some type of invitation, this person responds to the gospel, and Paul heals him. Boom, right there. Paul heals him right on the spot. And immediately, everybody else that was in that Bible study declared Barnabas and Paul as gods. They declared Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul, Hermes. And Paul and Barnabas went nuts. Do not do that. And so they tore their clothes and went crazy about do not do that. You're going to get us in trouble. All right? It is out of that, out of that whole deal out of that whole deal that's going on, they, and they start offering sacrifices to them. And they shut them down. They shut all that down. And then you get in to Paul comes back to them. Paul comes back. He says, apparently you missed the gospel I preach. So Paul comes back again to this group of people, and he said, listen, I came to deliver you from this dead, idolatrous religion to serve a living God through his son, Jesus Christ. And he goes back and preaches the gospel again. And the people have ears to hear and people get saved. Now, was not In the second evangelistic meeting that came out as a result of them trying to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas as gods, And him going into another service for now that people have an ear to hear the gospel. The Jews get wind that's what's going on. And they come down and disrupt the meeting. 
and stoned Barnabas and Paul. In that stoning, it is believed by Paul that he died and went to heaven. And if you want to read more about that, you could read 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul talks about it. 2 Corinthians 12, where he actually believed he died and went to heaven. And as a result, that's where he got his thorn in the flesh. Came from that whole experience of being stoned, going to heaven and being sent back with a thorn in the flesh. Part of the healing of coming back was to keep a thorn. And he tells you why in 2 Corinthians 12, why God didn't remove the beating that he had, the physical beating that he got from being stoned to death. Paul explains to us why he still had disability from that stoning. Are you with me? Oh, you need to read that. That's wonderful reading. That all occurred on this first trip, and it all occurred right here. And what you have is a conflict with the gospel with two groups of vain religion. On the one hand, you've got Greek, Roman, idolatrous, pagan religion. On the other hand, you've got Jewish religion that's rejected Jesus as the Christ and the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And when you look at two religions that were both classified vain religions, there was one that stood out as really bad. Would you agree with that? The Jewish one. Because they took the messengers of the word of God, which they embraced the word of God. They took those men out, two Jewish men out, and stoned them to death. That's, the others didn't do that. In fact, they were glad to hear something positive. You have two vain religions. One is legalistic, and the other is idolatrous, and they're both opposed to the gospel. One is open to it because they've never heard it before. The other is opposed to it. They were opposed to it when they killed the founder of it. Hey, Everybody talks about Christianity, right? As a world religion, Christianity. Do you know where Christianity begins? It could be a gate question. Do you know where Christianity begins? Do you know where it begins in your life? Do you know, you're not born into it. You got to be born again into it. See, almost all religions, you can grow into it. Listen, you don't grow, you don't, just because you got people in your family go to church, just because your family have a Bible and may have devotions and believe in it, doesn't mean you're okay. Every person that comes into Christianity has to go through the cross, has to go the, through the fact that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and three days later raised from the dead. It's called the gospel. Every person that believes that becomes a Christian. Christianity begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christianity begins with Jesus died on a cross, being buried on third day, raised from the dead. That's the birth of Christianity, people. That is the birth of Christianity. And that's the message you and I carry. That's the message Paul carried. He carried it to both two great religions of his day, Greek, Roman, idolatry, and the Jewish he carried it to whoever would listen, and that was who was listening. And a listen, times haven't changed, baby. The times haven't changed. We still need to carry that message out there. Both groups still need to hear it. The unsaved and the, and, and, and the legalistic still need to hear the message of grace. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is gift of God, not of works, least any man boasts. That's the message. When he, when he preached it to the idolatrous people of the Greek Roman Empire, they responded enormously. When he preached it to the Jews, they picked up stones to stone them. Listen, he still went and preached to both groups. 
Now, mo most of us would have said, well, I'm done with that group. <laughs> stole me once, don't stole me twice, right? Most of us would have went, well, I, I got your message loud and clear. I'm going over here. But, you know, Paul never did that. And if you want to read a great one, read chapter, when you're in 2 Corinthians looking at 12, read 11 before you read 12. So, vain religion. He says, men, he says to the idolatrous group, men, why are you doing these things? We are men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel. You see, that's the only answer to both, whether it's vain religion or pure religion. The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach the gospel, and you should turn from these things to a living God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in it. Vain religion, you can see it working in Acts 25. On your own now, not now, but on your own, you're going to see it. Here's Paul again. Now we're in Acts 25. We're, 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 we've gone, he's gone through two, two missionary trips, and here we are in, in a third and once again, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's in trouble with the Jews. They've put him in prison, and they've put under a death penalty, and Paul appeals to Rome because he's a Roman citizen as well as a Jewish citizen. He appeals to Rome. He said, nobody's going to try me anymore under Jewish court. I am through with the Jewish court system. Nobody's going to try me under the Jewish system anymore. He says, I appeal to Rome, and so he goes, he's now under the custody of Rome, and Rome is going, and, and the Romans are going to see, they're going to take him uh, to Rome and be tried as a Roman citizen because he can't be tried anywhere else. Okay? Now we're in Acts 25 and 26, and Paul is in court. The Romans have him, and they say to him, the Roman uh, rulership, not in Rome, but out, on, out, out in uh, the conquered areas, say, we've got to have a better case to, take him, to send him to Rome. We have to have a letter from our court system to take it to Rome court system, or we're going to be in deep trouble. We can't, we can't send Paul because Paul has made some Jew, because there's a dispute in the Jewish religion. This Jew, they don't like what he's preaching. We don't care. <laughs> this is a Jewish dispute over some kind of religious gobbledygook we don't care about. If we send him to Rome, we better have a good reason to take him out of our court system and send him to Rome. So they put him in two courts. They send him through uh, two, two court systems, one under Festus and one under uh, Agrippa. They put him through a court system. They're trying to figure out, this is Acts 25, 26, trying to figure out, we got to have, because if not, I'll tell you who head's going to roll when <laughs> we send him to Rome and we, got, we have no reason to do that. Our heads are going to roll. The Caesar will reach out and chop our head off. Okay? So this is pretty serious business. So they put him through. And when you read this, Acts 25, for uh, ni verse 19, it, it tell, they're, they're discussing this dispute of some kind of religious gobbledygook in the Jews. Then it goes on in verses 25, 26. Uh, I talked some more about that, about why did they want to put this man to death? we would never put this man to death other than Roman law. We've got to find a good reason to put him. They want to put him to death because he disputes them with some kind of theological gobbledygook. We can't do that. Then we get into chapter 26. Now, in chapter 26, I want to show you something. I'm just showing you the conflict between vain and pure religion. In chapter 26... He's in, he, he goes through a different court. He's now in a different court setting. I want you to look at what, now he's be, he was first before Festus, and now Festus reminds me, reminds me of uh, Gunsmoke. Festus, well, anyhow. Uh, now he's with Agrippa. 
And 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 there there is a there and so he goes through this whole thing. Agrippa goes like, ah, oh, because Agrippa is very knowledgeable of Jewish stuff. So he's so he says to him, Agrippa, you know Jewish doctrines. They want to put they listen. This whole thing is over the dead being raised. It's over the resurrection. And you know what this is about. Well, Agrippa listens to all of it, and Paul gives his argument of why this should not be disputed among the Jews at all. Because the Jews of all religion believed in the same resurrection that he was preaching. Okay? Watch this. Here's what King, here's what, here's what King Agrippa, in verse, this is a great line, uh, he says in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Is he, he's, he's gone back to the prophets to, to, to make his case before King Agrippa. Uh, and, and it's about the Messiah coming and dying on a cross, being raised from the dead. He's preaching, he's preaching to him Isaiah 52 and 53. Well, he gets down to verse 28, 29. Now listen, this is a famous line. King Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. You remember that? And Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. In other words, he gives him the gospel. He says, listen, anybody can be become a Christian. You got to believe the gospel. Christianity begins with the gospel. That's my point. Now, you want some good reading, you should read this. I just gave you the synoptic view of it. You really should read that. Let me give you four ideas this morning before I close out this session. In one of my courses in theology school, we studied the 11 world religions. The 11 world religions of the world. So, I got, when I began this study and got wanted to deal with religion and pure and vain. I went back to old books on my shelf, and believe it or not, I still had my old book on this. Dr. Hume had written a book that we studied called World Living Religions. According to whom, and I remembered this, in fact, I bold printed it in my book that I had, my textbook, that Asia, the common denominator of all 11 world religions, was Asia was the birthplace of every one of them. Isn't that interesting? You know why? Because the devil is that tricky. He's, he's tricky. He's not going to, I mean, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to, well, my religion was in Asia. Where was your Asia? Mine too. What gives you any, any, any privilege over me? He is slick. All religions, with, with his part from Christianity, are pagan. Or as, as he says, vain. Three of the world religions declared their origin from the Bible and Abraham. Three of the 11 not only claimed Asia, but they claimed Abraham. They proclaimed the Bible and Abraham. I'm talking about the Bible you and I have. When they get the Bible, then they, they mess with it and come up with their own versions of it. But they all start with the Bible, and they all start with Abraham. Judaism goes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into the seed. Islam goes from Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau. And Christianity goes from Adam, Seth, Shem, Abraham, to Jesus Christ. Now, we got the, we got the right deal. But I'm show, showing you how the devil, how tricky he is to take stuff and distort it. And you, you always need to remember that. You, and so... That's the background of the, the three major religions. 
and, and the three major religions have something in common. They're all missionary, except for Judaism. Judaism, out of these three religions, is not, listen, Muslims are very, are very missionary-minded. It's one of the fastest-growing religions in the world. Next to Christianity, and Judaism isn't. They don't do missionary work. They were supposed to, they were called to be missionaries, and they never did it. Never did it. Never did it. Here's the second thing. The Greek word for religion, which I, I, I wrote on your paper, triskegia, is used in our lesson text three times to distinguish between vain and pure Christian religion. What, what, listen, He's going to come back and he's going to talk about next week. He's going to talk about how vain religion can get in Christianity. He did it. He did it in our text. You just, that wasn't where I was pushing you today to look. This word for religion in the Greek language is interesting because it has two reference points. One reference point is external ceremonial ritual. That's vain religion. It's shadow without substance. In Judaism, they have ritual or shadow without substance. That makes legalism vain. The substance must always be Jesus Christ. If you're looking at the Bible reference, like Hebrews 10.1, you know, if you have a shadow, something's got to be behind the shadow, right? And whatever the shadow is, the substance will tell you what it is. The shadow may not tell you what it is, right? Have you not seen a shadow? You walk around the corner and go like, oh, it's a tree. No, it's a man. No, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's a Superman. I don't know. When you read Hebrews 10th chapter verse 1, it tells you that the law was a shadow pointing us to Christ. That's important that you know that. That's one part of it. The other part of it, the other part of religion is that it works off from a solid base of theology thinking or of doctrinal ideas, beliefs. They may be right, they may be wrong. They may be right and applied wrong. Okay? So when you have the word religion in the, in the Greek text, when you have it, you have one idea. You have religion. You have a ceremonial ritual, ritual without reality. It's a shadow of something. On the other hand, and, and it could be behind the scene as well, you have a body of beliefs. If you ever studied the Roman and Greek culture, religious culture, you would see that. They had all these gods. They had all this ceremonial stuff. And behind it was a whole system of what the gods could do, right? You studied Greek mythology in school, didn't you? Well, probably not. I don't know. It was, it, it, it was, it was a mandatory when I went to school. It wasn't optional. War and Peace, you remember that? About that thick. War and Peace. That wasn't optional. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't optional. And they, they, they didn't have, all, they, they didn't have, when I went through school, they didn't have those, um, what do you call those, uh, cliff notes. Didn't, boy, thank God, I was in college when they came out with them, and I went, mm, wish you'd had this when I was in high school. I'd have probably never graduated. <clears throat> Point number three. Oh, wait, I, I've got one more thing. It was used, this word was used by Paul uh, for Judaism, legalistic ritual theology beliefs, in Colossians, the second chapter, you need to read that. In Col not now, but in Colossians 2, 8, 16 through 19, and verse 23. It's a wonderful, Paul does a wonderful thing out there, and he talks about these rituals without reality, these shadows without substance. And uh, Judaism, they made the law, the law was a shadow, and they never pointed it to anything. They believed in a shadow without ever, without ever identifying what the shadow was, what it was. So in Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 24, Paul says, the law was always to point you, point you the substance. The law was always to point you 
as a shadow of the substance of Christ. Always pointed you to Jesus Christ. So, you know, you can always check people's teaching out to see where their substance leads you. If it's the law, where's the law take you? If it don't take you to Christ, forget it. Forget it. It's, it's, it's shadow without substance. It's ritual without reality. Now, here's the third point. Christianity begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ in the life of each person who believes it for grace salvation. Now, you're not going to go to heaven because you go to church. You're not going to go to heaven because you do good things. You're not going to go to hell because you do bad things or don't go to church. The issue is, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins on that cross, was buried on the third day, raised from the dead? 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 3 and 4 says, that's the gospel. Anything less. And then, that's, that's the message. Here's the mechanics. For by grace are you saved, by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves, the gift of God. Romans 1.16 says the gospel, he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You can't save yourself. I can't save you. I can give you the message. I can tell you the mechanics, but only you volitionally can do it. That's called believe. Believe. In all of your other studies you're going to do this week, there's one you should look at really carefully. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And when you read that, listen to me now, that's one sentence. You almost have to take a breath in the middle of it. If you, go, you read that thing, you almost have to take a breath, go, and to finish it. That's one, that's one sentence. One sentence means one thought. Now, that's a lot of verses. It's one of the longest sentences in the Greek, in the Greek of the New Testament. One, and boy, is that a powerful. Is that powerful? Oh, my goodness, people. When you read that, remember... He's conveying one idea. I, you, could, you, could, you could teach a year on that one sentence in the Greek language. That's how powerful that one sentence is, right? And let me tell you, it's worth reading. One Greek sentence. Every prophetic reference in the Old Testament of the first coming of Christ was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give us eternal life. Can you imagine that? Listen, they were fulfilled until he died on the cross. He didn't complete his mission. Unless he goes to the cross. If he goes, if he goes to the cross under anybody else's will other than his own, the will that God has put in his heart, he ain't going to make it. You did, listen, Gethsemane, the prayer of Gethsemane, not my will but thy will be done. About what? Drinking the cup of the sins of the world to give you the cup of salvation by grace through faith and not of yourself being a gift. Wow. John, the fifth chapter, verse 24 on your, on your paper. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Remember, that's a great line that Jesus always gave. When he did, you ought to write it down. Every time you, when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, or he says, I tell you the truth, boy, you better write that down. You better write that down. And here's one, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned, but has been passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life. When did that happen? The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you pass from spiritual death into spiritual life. You know, how that lo you know how long that life is? You know what that life is called? It's called eternal life. How long's eternal? Eh, you should say forever. How long's forever? When I was in school at Sanford, I had an English teacher walked in the room, and she started... And she drew a line 
all the way across the room and then out to the other door. You put a dot in the middle of it. She said, that line is eternity. That dot's the most important period in your life. That dot is you. And that dot is the gospel of Jesus Christ. She explained the dot and she said, when you believe, you get to go on in that eternal line. When you don't, there's a whole different consequence for your life. Because at that line, that line is an eternal line, and only can you stay in that eternal line through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that line, when it goes out from that dot, is called the eternal life. How about that? Eternal life. Eternal life. Pretty powerful idea. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 15, For this reason Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, in order that since by death he has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may, may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. In the ninth chapter of that same book, Hebrews, verse 12, he calls it eternal redemption. He calls it eternal redemption. Eternal. You know what that is? It's eternal. And when did I get when did I get my redemption? I got it the moment I believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How long is it? And that's when I got redeemed. Redeemed by the blood. Oh, the blood. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. How, how many times have we sing that in church? Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's Ephesians 1 7. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know what you get the moment? You get eternal what? Redemption. Now, don't you get redemption? You get eternal redemption. You know, what it, you know what it is? Gift. And not only did he give you that, but listen, he gave you 50 more things you can get in a little pamphlet, 50 things. You can go online and pick it up or probably you've got one around here somewhere. Somebody brought you here. Right? Somebody brought you here. That person can get you one. You need to read those 50 things you got. You can never lose in time and eternity. But you know why? Because you got eternal redemption. And not only do you have an eternal redemption, you got eternal everything. <laughs> it's called eternal life. Come on, people. Point four. Vain religion is the devil's alternative to pure religion, the pure religion of the gospel of grace salvation through faith. Jesus dealt with Nicodemus. You know, what's interesting, when you do John 3, 1 through 16, which is a story, everybody quotes 16, but, you know, he closes that thing out with him. I think it goes to like 21 or something. I don't remember, but it's a long distance. He spent a long time with Nicodemus that evening when he came by after dark with a hoodie and everything so he could be recognized. No, I don't know. But he came by night not to be recognized, for sure. And Jesus goes in this wonderful discussion with him. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. How is it possible that you being a, a, a teacher of, of the religious faith of Israel out of the word of God don't understand what I'm telling you? How is it possible that you don't understand that you must be born again? How is it possible that you don't understand the gospel, which is the centerpiece of the entire Bible? How is that possible, Nicodemus? I'll tell you how it was possible. Vain religion. And so Jesus has straightened them out. Apparently you're interested. I mean, you, you come by the cover of night because it's, it's dangerous for you. And I can clear this up. But it'll be more dangerous for you when you leave than when you came. Think about that. Because you don't like anybody to rock your world. You don't like anybody to move you out of your comfort zone. Think about that. There is no such thing anymore as a comfort zone. Your world, your world should be rocked all the time. And you should be thankful for it. Because you have the truth and people need it. And sometimes we need it ourselves in some of those moments in our life where God puts something on our life and it takes our breath away. And we think for sure he'll take it away in a week. For sure he'll take it away in a month. 
For sure, he'll take it away in a few years. For sure, he'll do this. And he left it. You still have it. And it can either be a blessing or a curse. It'll either be a blessing or a curse. And sometimes it's both. And sometimes it leaves you with great guilt. And God knows your heart. You keep your heart pure with him. He don't care the stuff you wrestle with. He, he, he cares how the match ends. Jacob wrestled with him all night. And it was all about how you wrestle with God. It's how you wrestle. In the end, he's the victor. And at some point, you just give it to him. Come on now, people. You, now you know why God brought you here today. Listen, you're not going to go through this life without this. Paul didn't. When Paul thought things couldn't get tougher out of 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, when Paul thought things could not get tougher in his life than they got, he got chapter 12 and they stoned him to death. He died and went to heaven. Well, thank you, Lord. And then he sent him back. <laughs> now you talk a bad day. That's a bad day. <laughs> There can never be a worse day in your life than that. <laughs> but listen, God didn't give it to you if it wasn't a gift. Listen to me. Please tell me that. Everything God puts on your plate is a gift. You know how I know it? Because it starts, it starts with the gospel of Jesus. Is that a gift? Is eternal, is, is eternal salvation a gift? And everything else that he puts on your plate is a gift. Accept it as a gift. Embrace it. And I'll tell you what you got to don't miss. When he puts that on you, it's not in you, but on you. You know, I think sometimes it's easier to handle stuff he puts in you, to, the burden you have to bear, than on you. He puts it in you. Not, that's a, for me, it's easier to do it than the ones he put on you. Because you have to deal with other people's volition. You have to deal with other people's stuff. And how many times have we thought to myself, God, if you just put that on me and take it off from them, right? Have you been a parent? Oh, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. When he doesn't, and listen, when he doesn't, not only are you the one that he's chose to bear it, but it's to develop relationships between you and God that could be developed no other way. And for you to be the lighthouse of everybody that comes and goes so that they have a piece of Jesus when they come and when they go, because maybe the person that it is on that you're attached in ministry to as the caregiver is not capable of having that extended ministry just because of the level they're in, the level of pain, the level of whatever they're in. And so God has answered your prayer. God has answered it. Father, put it in me rather than on me. Put it in me rather than in them. Honestly, he's done that. Because you've become the lighthouse for ministry over that person's difficulty, their, their undeserved suffering. And not only you to coach them, but you, God is going to give you a ministry. You think, well, my life is restraint. My life is, my, I don't have the freedom I once had. Listen, you've got more than you ever realized. It's just different. This is Christianity as its best. This is Christianity as its best. When you have to pull the power of God, not only for your life, but for the other person's life, and the perimeter around which the hospitals, the doctors, the people that come, the people who go, the people who are engaged in ministry, connected with you, prayers that are associated with you. This is, the, listen, 
You need to see the bigger picture in it. This is Christianity. This is Christianity at its best. And this is where that light of Christ just beams out in the most magnificent ways to other people's life. I left, I left you today with a prayer. I left you with a prayer that Jesus does, and I broke it down for you. I want you to do a home study this week on this prayer. This prayer is going to help you. If I've said anything today that's touched your life, this prayer is an extension of that. And if I have, you'll read this prayer, and this prayer will be beneficial to your life in a way you'll never understand it. And so I wrote it out, and I kind of broke it down into three parts as I saw this prayer. And I want you to see this prayer that Jesus prays. Not only for himself, who's got to be this bearer, who's got to carry the burdens of everybody. Agreed? And he, his prayer is broken in three parts based on this concept. And you need to read it. Read it in that three parts and find your role in it. This prayer will, will show you how to pray as a caregiving ministry. This prayer is a powerful prayer because he's going to be a burden carrying Christ. And he prays about that. He's not, going, he's not bearing this for his. He's bearing it for ours. And there's a great lesson here to all of us. Okay, let's pray. Men will take an offering. We'll take a 15-minute break. Let's pray. Look, you've heard, you've heard my message today. It's been all over the place, but there's points of it. On, it's, there's been some points here that has touched your soul. And I want you to call, recall those points. Those are the issues that are pertinent upon you. I want you to stop in a moment. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want you to, you don't go to a message. He doesn't touch you somewhere or another. I mean, he's got you somewhere. Focus on that. Don't focus on the whole message right now. Focus on what he's talked to you about today. Focus right there. And then when you have this little moment of prayer, pray that God would be able to, you'd be able to extend this this idea that he has touched your heart with today, find a way, pray that God would extend that idea out of you. Embrace that idea. Let God teach you. He brought you to, he's wanting to teach you something very important today. So let's have a word of prayer with every bowed head and every eye closed. And I just want you to take a little time with yourself a moment. Just a little bit of time. And those things that he's touched you with today, those, those things that just caught your attention, Talk to him about that. Ask him to extend that. Ask, ask him to bring that more with more clarity. Well, Father, here we are. We're right there where Jesus was in John 17 when he made his prayer. We are those people in John 17 right now. We are those people in that prayer. Those who have actually prayed. Who have looked at some identity of something that's touched their heart today in this message. And are looking within on that. For more clarity. For more boldness. For whatever. They now are part of that John 17 prayer themselves. When they go home this week, may the Holy Spirit touch their life because the answer that they're seeking is found in John 17 in one of the three sections of Jesus' prayer. I know that, Father. It's the reason it's there. And I pray we'd all do it. Stir them and don't let them off from it. Make them, stir them, Father. Make them, make them do this. Stir them. It is important to their life. They get identity. They will find their answer within that prayer. That's why Jesus prayed it. We thank you for these that have come our way, Father. We thank you for the message. We thank you for the encouragement 
that comes to our heart today. We needed to be encouraged today. And we got it in the most strange way. But ain't that always the way? I mean, it just seems to be that way, Father. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.